Welcome everybody to the third episode of the 1953 Bowman Color Team Sets. The series I'm slowly but surely putting together where team by team we take a look at all the cards from the 1953 Bowman Color set. Today we're going to be looking at the St. Louis Cardinals. In 1953, this team and the city of St. Louis itself was experiencing some serious changes and a major facelift in the form of a renovated stadium. But before we get to that, let's assemble this team. Okay, so right off the bat, let's get to the most imposing card of this set, Mr. Alpha Brazel. Definitely a good pitcher. We'll get to some of his stats later on. Next up, Cloyd Boyer in a six. This is one of the first cards I got when I started collecting this set. We have Del Rice here in an excellent five, catcher for the Cardinals. Next up, Jerry Stolle, pitcher for the Cardinals. Really great pose. It's a similar pose coming up here in a moment. Here's Eddie Stanky, probably taken just a few moments after the Stolly photograph. Here we've got Red Shandinst. No batting gloves required. Here's Larry Miggins and an excellent five. A lot of these Cardinals cards are kind of tucked off to the side of the polo grounds underneath the uh, awning. Here's Solly Hemus, an excellent player for the Cardinals this year in 53. One of the most underrated cards in this set, Ina Slaughter. I love this card. It's just absolutely an eye-catcher. I think it's one of the most beautiful cards in the whole set. Definitely worth an extra look here. And uh, I'd put this in the top five of this set for sure. Always looks like Enos is about to storm the beaches of Iwo Jima or something like that. It's just a really cool card. And of course, the crown jewel of the St. Louis Cardinals in this year, Mr. Stan the Man Musial. Just one of the best cards ever. And there you have it, the 1953 team set for the St. Louis Cardinals. So, let's take a look at what was going on in 1953 in St. Louis, in particular with Sportsman's Park. So in 1953, August Anheuser-Gussie Bush Jr., the beer baron of Anheuser-Busch, bought the team from the previous owner who was in financial trouble. Reportedly, he could have gone to higher bidders, including Milwaukee and Houston, who at the time were in the early stages of trying to acquire a Major League Baseball team, but the previous owner decided to go with Bush because he wanted the team to stay in St. Louis. Now, meanwhile in St. Louis, something else was happening. The St. Louis Browns owner, Bill Veck, decided that now was the time to make his move concerning his beleaguered team. We're gonna talk more about the St. Louis Browns in another episode. But one of the first things that he did was to sell Sportsman's Park to the Cardinals. The park had fallen into serious disrepair, and there was even a threat from the city to have it condemned. So, once acquiring the St. Louis Cardinals and buying Sportsman's Park, Bush set to work renovating the park right after the 1953 season was completed. A new playing field was installed, new wider seats replaced the existing ones, the seating in center field was completely removed and replaced 
with a batter's eye and shrubbery. New dugouts were installed and the clubhouses were updated as well. In addition, the ballpark was stripped of all the advertising with the exception of a Budweiser ad. Atop of the scoreboard was the Anheuser-Busch symbol, a neon eagle that would flap its wings any time a home run was hit. Bush originally wanted to call the stadium Budweiser Stadium, but when the name was overturned by Major League Baseball because of its connection to his brewery, he settled on Bush Stadium instead, and then later on very cleverly developed a new product for his brewing company called Bush Beer. Incidentally, the brewing company went from being the fourth largest in the country to the largest pretty soon after acquiring the St. Louis Cardinals. Okay, let's do some stats. So first up, we'll take a look at some pitchers. Here's the Alpha Brazel. In 1953, Alpha Brazel had a six and seven record with a 4.19 ERA. So not the greatest year for Brazel. However, he did lead the National League that year in saves with 18 of them. Next up is Jerry Stolle. Stolle was an all-star this year. In fact, there were a ton of St. Louis Cardinals that made the all-star team in 1953. This year, Stolle had an 18-9 record with a 3.99 ERA, and incidentally, he also led the majors with uh, hit-by-pitches with 17 of them. So players that year probably didn't really enjoy facing Stolle. Okay, let's look at some offense. First up is Solly Hemus. He had a 279 average with 14 home runs and 61 RBI. As it turns out, he also led the league on the other end of hit-by-pitches, by being beamed 12 times. Next up, Stan the Man. Was obviously going to be an all-star that year. It's Come on, it's usual. He had a 337 average, which is just amazing. 30 home runs and 113 RBI. He was 8th in MVP voting that year. Next up, another all-star, you know, Slaughter. He had a 291 average with 6 homers and 89 RBI. And last but not least, Red Shandienst, also an all-star, with a 342 average, 15 home runs, and 79 RBI. He was fourth in MVP voting that year. So the Cardinals played at Busch Stadium until May 8th, 1966, when the last game was played. The Cardinals moved into a new Busch Stadium in downtown St. Louis only days later. The old Bush Stadium and what was once Sportsman's Park was demolished soon after. Today it's the site of the Herbert Hoover Boys Club. A field is at the same location where the Cardinals and Browns once played. So that about does it for this episode. In retrospect, I really should have had a Budweiser with me, but what are you going to do? Hope you guys enjoyed taking this look at the St. Louis Cardinals. Thanks so much for watching, guys, and I hope you'll join me on the next episode. Until then, take care, and I'll talk to you all soon.